Hello, and welcome to the Colorado Broadband Office's special webinar series focusing on student connectivity. I'm Teresa Ferguson, Director of Federal Broadband Engagement with the Colorado Broadband Office, and I will be your host for today's session. The goal of this webinar series is to shine a light on the complex issues of ensuring broadband access for all students to engage in e-learning. Over the course of the next three weeks, we will talk with school districts, broadband providers, and policymakers about the challenges of connecting students, defining needs, how to fund student connectivity, and innovative solutions that have overcome these challenges. We are excited to kick off this series today with district stories. Our speakers will discuss their experiences with student connectivity and how remote learning needs have changed <clears throat> with the shift to full-time e-learning. Our second webinar will be held on October 21st and will follow, focus on how e-rate funding relates to student connectivity at home and explore concepts to modernize the E-Rate program to accommodate student connectivity. The third and final se session will be held on November 4th and will focus on how broadband providers and school districts have worked together to implement innovative and collaborative solutions. A few logistics uh, for today's webinar. To prevent background noise, please keep yourself muted during the presentation. We've allowed sufficient time for Q&A following our panelists' remarks. You can enter questions in the chat at any time during the webinar and the CBO staff will read them during the Q&A. We will also provide the opportunity for you to unmute yourself to ask questions during the Q&A. Today's webinar will be recorded and available at the Colorado Broadband Office website at broadband.co.gov. Before we jump into the district stories, we will begin today's session with a brief overview of two recently created state grant programs that school districts can tap into to address student connectivity. First, Delilah Collins, State E-Rate Coordinator from the Colorado Department of Education will give an overview of the Connecting Colorado Students Grant Program, followed by Ali Kimmel, Senior Policy Advisor to Governor Polis with an overview of the Governor's RISE Fund. We will have a brief Q&A following Delilah and Ali's remarks. Delilah, thank you so much for being with us today. Please tell us about the Colorado Department of Education's Connecting Colorado Students Grant. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, welcome everyone. Again, I'm Delilah Collins. I'm the Assistant Director in the ESCA Programs Office, as well as the State E-Rate Coordinator here at the Department of Education. And um, I'm not sure if you are aware of the background as to how we came about this Connecting Colorado Students Grant, but I just want to give you a brief kind of overview of where these funds come from and the other funding sources that can be used in order to provide connectivity to students. The CARES Act had the Education Stabilization Fund and the CARES Relief Fund, the CRF Fund, that was available or that is available to school districts. Um, the CRF funds were directly um, deposited into districts' accounts through a PPA method. And then the Education Stabilization Funds were grant funds. Um, there was the ESSER um, the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, which was $120 million, and then the Governor's Education Relief Fund, the GEAR Fund, which is $44 million. Um, out of those two pots of money, um, money that was allotted for the Elementary and Secondary Emergency Relief Fund, um, the state of Colorado or the Department of Education was allowed to withhold 9.5% for um, state level activities. And out of that 9.5%, um, we created a public private partnership with the governor's office, the attorney general's office, the department of education and internet service providers um, to provide additional funding to connect students to um, broadband. And so um, the governor's office announced the project 10 million um, through T-Mobile, which is offering 34,000 low-income households with Wi-Fi hotspots. And to support that, the Connecting Colorado Students Grant Program is providing an additional $2 million grant to schools to help provide broadband access to low-income family and families and school staff. And that $2 million is really to support those students that um, could not be helped through other programs like Project 10 million, um, in addition to staff who are also experiencing some issues with broadband connectivity in their, um, in their homes or even um, at the school. 
So the funds are it's $2 million. Um, districts may apply for these funds and they can apply on behalf of charter schools. Um, you can also apply as a uh, consortia with a partner, a, pu a public partner. Um, and the, the intent of the funds is to, again, provide connectivity to students and teachers or to look at larger projects to expand or create access in a geographical area to help support the development of broadband infrastructure um, to also connect students and teachers. Um, so while we know that there are some areas in the state that could not be served by some of the programs that providers are providing right now, um, we wanted to offer this additional $2 million to help brainstorm and to help get those students access um, in those hard to serve areas. The application was released last week and it is due on November 6th. Um, it's a very short application. There's a cover page. There's some signatures that are needed. Um, it's a very short narrative um, with a needs assessment um, and just telling us exactly what it is that is needed. Uh, eligibility for the program, again, is school districts on behalf of all schools or particular schools in your district. Um, BOCES, the Charter School Institute, uh, federally organized, recognized tribes, and then a consortia of those entities. Um, you can also partner with nonprofit community-based organizations and lo local governments. Um, we do have some prioritization on those funds. So we will provide a priority will be given to uh, those districts that have a high percentage of students who are eligible for free or reduced lunch and serve a high percentage of students with little to no access to broadband. Um, and so the, that program, like I said, is really designed to, um, to, to get connectivity to those um, students and uh, teachers that just we just can't get connectivity to. Um, the, and again, the application is due on November 6th. Um, and so this is just a small part of the overall funding out of the CARES Act program. So uh, the education, uh, the elementary and secondary school emergency relief fund, the ESSER funds, um, that was a broader pot of money for which districts can use technology or use the funds to purchase technology and to connect students um, that are having trouble getting access to um, connectivity. So for those schools that are still are online or doing a hybrid model, if you have students that are not able to get connected, um, we would ask that you look towards your, your ESSER funds um, to this grant and the governor's emergency relief fund, the GEAR, uh, through the RISE fund also can be used to provide connectivity to students. Um, so there's, there's a, a number of different pots of money that are out there um, that can be used in order to provide connectivity uh, to students. So we hope that um, this brief introduction will spark questions that we can answer um, and hopefully you'll be able to find a solution if needed to provide support to those students and teachers in your districts. Thank you so much, Delilah. That was a great summary. I know you covered a lot of ground very quickly there and we'll, we'll, we'll look forward to the Q&A session to answer yep. some of those questions that I think are coming up. Next, we have Allie Kimmel from the governor's office. Allie, thank you for being with us today. Uh, please tell us about the Governor's RISE program. Great. Thanks so much, Teresa. Um, great to be with all of you today, all of you today. Um, just to expand a little bit on, on Delilah's great overview of, of the many programs that um, CDE is offering and that have the resources that have already been provided for broadband um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Governor's Emergency Education Relief Fund. Uh, we used the majority of, of that funding, um, which was discretionary funding provided to governors to really address the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on certain communities. We used the majority of that funding to create a new, uh, a new fund called the, uh, the Response Innovation and Student Equity Fund or the RISE grant. The, primary purpose of the RISE grant is, is not broadband or internet connectivity. It is 
instead to address the disproportionate impact of COVID on certain communities and to push those communities um, and provide the resources necessary to do things differently for the highest needs students. And so there are a number of different focus areas within that where we're really interested in um, student uh, transitions from higher education, from K-12 to higher education, in student-centered learning, in rethinking uh, you know, student persistence and graduation in higher ed and, and in K-12, uh, looking at really innovations that are come from partnerships between community-based organizations and school districts. So that fund, there's more information at uh, the, the website here. The first round applications are actually due on Saturday. Um, and the second round applications are due on December 19th. Like I said, uh, connectivity is, is an allowable use of, of, a, of a program that would be uh, funded through, through RISE, but not the primary purpose. So happy to answer any specific questions about that. Thank you, Allie and Delilah. Now let's open it up to questions um, and Q&A. Megan, do we have questions from the audience or do you have some questions for, our, for Allie and for Delilah? Uh, there's one question so far. It says, uh, do any of these programs allow ISPs to access funds to improve their low income programs? So the Connecting Colorado Students Grant Program is a grant to, um, to LEAs, to local education agencies. Um, so the funding cannot go to a uh, ISP. However, uh, the district, uh, the LEA and the ISP can coordinate on a plan that will help support and provide services in areas that um, there is a need. So um, it wouldn't be the recipient of the grant would not be the ISP, it would be the school district. I have one question for you, for both of you. I know with the, a lot of the CARES Act funding, there were timelines on things. Mm -hmm. So if a applicant, if a school district was fortunate enough to apply for and receive funding through either of these programs, do they have a deadline to, to spend that money or does that money just have to be committed by a certain timeline? Can you shed some light on that for us? Uh, so I'll start with the um, elementary and secondary emergency relief fund. Uh, that fund is um, a, it goes through June of 2021. And then there's a tidings period that takes us through September of 2022. So districts will have the opportunity to uh, access those funds through, excuse me, through September of 2022. Um, there are other pots of money in the CARES Act that do have a shorter life, exp life expectancy, specifically the um, CARES relief funds, CRF funds, uh, that were allocated directly to school districts. Those have to be expended by December 31st of 2020. So those have a very short life. Um, all the funds have to be expended and cannot be carried over. However, on the other side, underneath the education stabilization funds, we do have um, enough time to uh, ward those funds and districts have time to spend those um, up until September of 2022. And uh, the GEAR fund or the RISE fund allowable time frame is the same as ESSER, which uh, you, it needs to be spent. Any funding under GEAR needs to be spent by September 22. Perfect. Thank you. I know there's a lot of confusion in the communities, at least that, that we're hearing from, <clears throat> about that timeline for those. So. Megan, additional questions? Uh, nothing through the chat yet. Is there anyone on the call who would like to unmute themselves and ask questions? I guess we could pause for a second to see if there's anyone. Don't be shy. <laughs> We're just all here together on, you know, the Brady Bunch channel. <laughs> <laughs> and I will be sharing the the slide deck, uh, which has these two links in there for folks who want to reference this later. Perfect. Thanks, Megan. Well, we can always open up questions later um, from the audience too. So let's, let's dive in now. Let's get into our district stories panel discussion. In this portion of the webinar, we will take a deep dive into the challenges that districts face in trying to identify their needs and identify short-term fixes while also considering long-term solutions. We will hear about the innovative quick fixes that districts implemented in the spring and how remote learning requirements have shifted 
as the new school, school year began highlighting the need for long-term broadband solutions. As you think of questions during our speaker's remarks, please submit them via the web chat or wait for Q and the Q&A session after the presentation. I want to thank Jovita Schiffer, Schiffer of Boulder Valley School District and Christy Center and Hayden School District and Lauren uh, Durkee of the Denver Public Schools to join us, thank them for joining us today and for sharing each of their district stories in these extraordinary times. Let's start with Jovita Schiffer, Partnership and Resource Manager at Al Alicia Sanchez International Elementary School. Welcome Jovita, please share Sanchez Elementary's story. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, so I'm Javita Schiffer. I'm the Partnership and Resource Manager at Alicia Sanchez Elementary School. And um, I've been there for many years and this year has definitely been one of the most challenging there. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? So home learning and Alicia Sanchez Elementary um, as many people experience the pandemic, it happened so fast. We, we, it was amazing how quickly we moved to virtual learning. Um, I have to say uh, BVSD was amazing and how quickly they responded to the need. We had already been working on the digital divide for a long time. Um, and I think it's important to also mention that at Sanchez, nearly 70% of our students are in the free reduced lunch program. Um, whereas in BVSD as a whole district, it's 20%. Many people are often surprised to hear that there is such a high level of poverty in any part of Boulder County. So I like to, to start off with that because it, it really frames um, the, the, the needs of our students and, and my work and my role. Uh, so when the pandemic hit and we went to virtual learning, many families didn't have devices or internet services. BVSD distributed nearly 300 Chromebooks just at Sanchez. I know they distributed thousands more across the, the district. We helped many families get connected for the first time to the internet. We even supported parents in teaching them how to use their devices. Um, we made a huge dent in reducing the digital uh, divide. And we reached a point at the end of the spring that nearly all students were connected to, to internet via multiple providers or hotspots. Next slide, please. So with spring home learning, I, I was amazed at how quickly our teachers adapted to this new way of doing school. They really rose to the occasion and they provided amazing um, lessons and, and content for our kids. It was mostly asynchronous at the time um, as we were all learning how to do school in a new way. Um, students could access content on a, on a specific website, classroom, and their assign they had assignments they could upload online. And there were a few live online synchronous sessions per week. We learned so much um, and we were fortunate to have a summer uh, to plan. And in the fall, when this new school year started, we rolled out a, a, a new and improved home learning program that really took into account all of the needs that our children had with, with education. And we really wanted to make a program that would, um, we don't know how long we would have to, to, to be online. And so we wanted it to be robust. It's now mostly synchronous learning. Most days include several hours of live learning sessions for students. And so when we made this new improved uh, home learning platform, we thought everything would be great, right? And because everyone isn't connected now. So with so many families connected, what could possibly go wrong? Well, we started to see that many households that had two or more students, they were experiencing frequent connection failures during home learning. At Sanchez alone, over 20%, and that's one out of every five students, is frequently losing connections or freezing up. They can't share their screens with their teachers. Um, we've, what we've learned from this is that the high quality uh, home learning programs that we're offering, there is not uh, adequate bandwidth offered with most providers' lowest tier programs. 
Uh, many providers have low income programs, but they do not provide adequate um, internet speeds, bandwidth speeds for remote learning. Uh, your, the basic packages often include 25 megabytes per second download speed and a three megabytes per second upload speed. And that's usually good for one student. But the three megabytes upload speed, which is not something we ever even talked about or, or knew, people often concentrate on the download speed because we're often downloading stuff. But now we're in an era where we're always uploading our images and having live streaming with, with, uh, with our jobs or with, with school. And so we found that the three megabytes per second upload speed is inadequate for more than two students in a household to access their home learning. And in my research and trying to find solutions to this, I also realized it, this isn't just, it's not unique to Sanchez, it's happening across the district and it's not unique to our district. It's happening in other districts across Colorado and even in other states. So really the, the best solution right now or the easy solution some might think is that families can just upgrade to achieve adequate internet speeds and um, and many of us do but most of the families at Sanchez can't afford it and there are so many families across Colorado and, and across the country that can't afford to just upgrade there's often a, also a big difference in price between the lowest tier programs and, and the next level up now BVSD can subsidize the cost for qualifying families but most providers don't have a system for this Except for Livewire Net, we have been working with this company for a few years and they have done amazing work with us in helping us connect families. They, um, they're the only provider that has actually uh, responded directly to this need. They raised their basic upload speeds from three megabytes per second to five megabytes per second. They also offer other tiers um, and they can direct bill BVSD for qualifying families as needed. So they have come to the table to work with us to help support families and they've been amazing. But other providers haven't. And so this means that only households with Livewire or those that can afford to pay for adequate internet with providers can get reliable access to remote learning. And so we don't know how long we'll be in home, home learning. And it may, right, we actually are moving into some in-person learning. Um, we, st we kicked off a few weeks ago and we're adding more students next week, but we don't know what, how long we will, we will, that will last or if there'll be changes again. I think we all um, re realize it could go back and forth. Um, home learning is going to be a part of our lives for a while, I think. Um, according to the CDE, CDC, sorry, I meant CDC. <laughs> um, Hispanics are 4.6 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID-19 than white persons. The risk is even higher for Black and Native American persons. 65% of Sanchez students are Hispanic, Black, or Native American. 35% of Sanchez parents opted out of in-person learning. So even when we go back to in-person, they will remain online. And so Sanchez has 107 students currently relying on home learning to access their education, even when other kids go back in person. If all children can't access adequate internet service to attend remote learning during a pandemic, this may be one of the greatest social injustices of our time. One that will impact many children for the rest of their lives we need better solutions for student connectivity. Thank you. Thank you, Jovita. I know that was a difficult um, um, you know, summary for many of your students, you know, a summary of, of what your students are experiencing. So thank you for sharing that with us. Next is Laura Durkee, Chief of Staff, Technology Department with Denver Public Schools. Lauren, please tell us about DPS's student connectivity journey. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much, Teresa. And Jovita, it was so great to hear, you know, a lot of the shared stories and we've um, definitely mirrored a lot of the same experiences. So, um, so yeah, excited to, um, to share our story, excuse me, <clears throat> and um, where we have come and kind of the challenges that still exist within our district. So next slide, please. 
So um, looking across the district, so as um, Teresa mentioned, I work for our Department of Technology that serves um, our district as a whole. So across um, DPS, we have about 93,000 students, 65% um, of which are FRL status. Um, so mirroring a lot of um, similar experiences um, that Sanchez Elementary went through as well. Um, prior to remote learning, we had about 14,000 students that were in our one-to-one -one MyTech program. So they were um, directly, um, you know, they of course had Chromebooks, internet setup, all of that. And so like the rest of the state, um, had to pivot very quickly um, from that 14,000 students to 93,000 students um, being able to access um, learning remotely. So thinking back to the spring, um, we had done a survey to parents to see, you know, what their internet connectivity was looking like. And so we were um, estimating about 8% of students did not have home internet access back in March, so at the start of the pandemic. Um, by the end of the semester, we are estimating about 4% still did not have um, home internet access. And um, this was despite a lot of efforts, of course, and effort going on. And so we know that, you know, there are definitely are ways still out there to reach our families. And so what we focused on in the spring, in addition to um, distributing Chromebooks, so I believe by the end of the spring, we distributed about 60,000 Chromebooks across both district and charter schools. Um, it was a combination of our, our schools directly distributing as well as um, we had, you know, district-wide distribution events, which um, in retrospect was crazy, but, you know, definitely it was, um, the need was very much there to get our students connected. Um, so in terms of internet, we focused on district-issued hotspots, um, similar to Boulder, we also provided info on Comcast Internet Essentials and other programs like that to our families um, who are able to access those programs. Um, we also had some really rogue solutions, you know, using cell phones for mobile hotspots in a pinch, knowing that's not sustainable, but just anything to get our students connected. Um, in by the end of the semester, we spent about six hundred sixty-seven thousand um, just on hotspots and unlimited data plans. So. A huge expense to the district, but obviously, you know, what we needed to do to get our students connected and be able to access um, learning. Um, so next slide, please. So then looking ahead to the fall, similar having, you know, the luxury of the, the summer to plan more. Um, our remote learning approach um, has definitely been dependent upon student internet access. So we use um, learning management systems across the district. So Schoology for our secondary grades and Seesaw for elementary, um, as well as Google Meet and Zoom and other um, streaming platforms that are used. We also shifted because in the springtime there was some use of paper packets, but that definitely has been very limited for the fall. So all that really driving home that for kids, um, for all of our kids to be able to access learning, internet is essential. Um, we continued efforts, so we distributed more hotspots to families, um, as well as um, providing more broadband info. Starry Connect was a new option that we um, saw in Denver as well. So in terms of spend for the fall, um, we spent an additional 52000 um, on hotspots and data plans. And then the ongoing cost, which is really um, something that makes things you know, less sustainable is the 92,000 that we're paying on a month to month basis um, to maintain the connectivity for students. So as similar to what Javita mentioned, you know, as the unknown of how long things will last and what things are gonna look like, um, this continued cost is something that definitely is top of mind for, for our district. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then thinking to looking ahead, you know, how we're going to reach all students because 4% by no means is acceptable. And we, we know that we need to ensure that every student, we're, we're hopeful that the 4% is very much um, decreased at this point. Um, but we know that we still have students that are having issues, whether they have a setup or not. And so thinking through barriers that very much exist, um, cost, of course, I mentioned a couple times. Um, lack of familiarity with setting up hotspots. So we realized, you know, even getting them in a kid's hands is not good enough. You know, just ensuring that they are able to get themselves set up properly, um, as well as the effort needed to set up home broadband. So even if we provide them all the info, they're 
um, can be barriers to credit card, having that to be um, something needed, as well as just you know, navigating the system that exists. Um, we also have been seeing um, a lack of coverage in the far northeast region of Denver. So by the airport, we know that um, service is not as strong as it is in other parts. So even if we provide a hotspot or another means, um, that still could be a barrier that exists. Um, and then approaches. So this is kind of our laundry list of all the things we have going um, to, you know, ensure we have all students connected, but we know we need you know, more sustainable solutions. So we have school technology partners throughout our schools. They are you know, the first line of defense for a lot of students to be able to troubleshoot. Um, our help desk is supporting now parents as well as students. Um, and this is in addition to our staff, which is how we normally run. Um, and it's offered in both Spanish and English to accommodate um, all families. Um, we've also provided a lot of guidance in multiple languages, so ensuring that that's accessible as well as medium. So having it in video as well as um, paper. Um, we've been doing hotspot delivery to homes directly just to, you know, transportation's a barrier, really trying to reach all kids. Um, home access verification. So through our registration, we've asked a question, you know, do you have internet? Do you have a computer? And just using that to capture more students. Um, we're working across different organizations on broadband sponsorship. So just if the district um, or if another entity can help with the cost for families. Um, and then last, the last two efforts we have going, which are, we're really excited about, is more Wi-Fi boosting on our campuses. So um, WAPs and other things to ensure that if students are accessing, you know, via, um, via the playground or other things that the Wi-Fi is going hopefully further. Um, and then lastly is hotspot usage transparency. So we have seen too that even when we distribute the hotspots, in some cases they're not always used. And so we've been sharing the usage reports with principals um, to engage families more, just to ensure that you know, they have what they need to really access and use the hotspots. So um, I know that's a lot, um, but that's, that's our um, story to date. And so we're really excited to learn from other districts as well as the state resources. Um, to have more sustainable solutions for our kids. Thank you, Lauren. I, I thank you for going through that laundry list of um, <laughs> of, of uh, activities that you've engaged in, initiatives that you've gone through to to you know, kind of do the acrobatics that were necessary to try to connect your students. And last but not least is Christy Center, Superintendent of Hayden School District. Chrissy, I know you're in a very rural area of Colorado and your story may be very different from um, the uh, two previous panelists. Please share um, Hayden School District's remote learning experience. You may be on mute. I was muted like I was supposed to be. So thank you, Teresa, and thank you everybody for being here. Our story is quite a bit different than what was just shared. Hayden is located about 15 miles to the west of Steamboat Springs, because most people don't even know where Hayden's at. We have about 2,000 members in our community, and we are, by definition, a bedroom community. Most of our people go into Steamboat, and some go into Craig to work. Those that stay in the area work at the coal mine, the power plant, or for the school district. Um, this, the school is the community hub. We do not have a rec center. That is where everybody goes for everything. So when the school shut down, it was very devastating for the community at large because then they really didn't have any place to go or do anything. When we left on spring break, we had an early spring break. And when we left is when everything hit. So our students never returned. So it was a very, they had no time to prepare, no time to do anything. And much like Lauren, and with her school district, we then, once we got everything back and kind of got ourselves together, we started checking out Chromebooks and doing all those things that we needed to do to get them in the hands. Um, our district is not fully one-to-one -one on tech devices, which then also made it really hard. We were very, very grateful to our families that said, you know, we have kids, they can share, just give us one, and we have an extra laptop, they can use that. So that really helped us get through. Um, but we're still working on trying to get more. One thing that hasn't been mentioned, devices right now are extremely hard to get. We have been on back order for Chromebooks right now for we ordered them in June and they're still on back order. And I talked to another district yesterday 
um, they ordered theirs in April and just got them. So it's just, it's hard. And if you've looked at the price of them lately, they have almost doubled. They're about 450 for a Chromebook that was 250. So lots of additional impacts besides broadband. It's actually getting the device in the kids' hands. Um, one thing that's not also been mentioned too is we're focusing on the broadband for our students. We have teachers in our area that don't have broadband for our teachers, and that makes it really hard for them to create lessons, do lessons, um, and it's just because of how remote we are. Right now we have about 15 to 18% of our kids that don't have internet access. Hotspots do not work in our area. If you come into town about the airport and five miles through town, there is no cell service. It's very spotty. The only company that has service is a company called Union. It's more of a local service and they have towers there. So like Verizon through town doesn't work, um, AT&T, none of them work. So when you have hotspots, it doesn't really help us to say, oh, get them a hotspot because we don't have that availability in our community. Um, we've worked with our district or our students to get them signed up if they needed internet and had that um, accessibility to it. Um, some signed up. We paid for what we needed to. That was not an issue, just like Lauren and Jovita did. Um, you know, we did what we needed to for our kids. However, there was some families that did not want to sign up. They were a, a fear of being tracked and a fear of being noted, and they just wanted to stay anonymous. And, you know, you have to respect them with that as well. Um, some of our families just don't have it. We're working with Illuminate, which is our local company. And there's a railroad track crossing issue. And if you've ever had to deal with the railroads and getting anything across railroad company lines, it is an extreme challenge and it takes months and months of work, paperwork, logistics. And, you know, they're still probably close to 12 months out of even getting access across the railroad, which some people don't realize those, that issue as well. Um, what we did in the springtime for our students is that didn't have internet or didn't want it is that we um, provided paper copies and travel drives for our kids. So our teachers would screencastify is what they mainly use. They would do their lessons that they could for those that couldn't access it. We did food pickup every Tuesday evening. And so we did frozen food for the week and would hand out bags of frozen food and the kids that needed paper copies would give them their paper copies, all the materials they need and a travel drive. So they'd have it the week to work on and would deliver which ones couldn't if that was an issue of transportation. Um, would deliver the next Tuesday when they came back to pick up their new packet, they dropped off their homework from the previous week. Um, not ideal, but it worked and it kept our students engaged as much as we needed to. As of right now, just like every district, we do have our plans going in place of, we are 100% in person and I'm so incredibly grateful for that. Knock on wood, we have not had a case of COVID. We've been in school every day, PK through 12, and it's been, it's been beautiful and it's really what our community and our kids needed to be connected. And so we're able to do that. One of my principals just asked yesterday, he's like, should we maybe try a remote day to make sure everything is working and da, 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 da. And I was just like, oh, I don't wanna like take my kids away from school for a day just to practice and see if everything's up and running in case we get COVID, should we? We probably should just like you practice any emergency situation, but I just, I don't wanna take our kids away from something beautiful that they have. But if we do go into, um, quarantine of any type. Our kids take their laptops back and forth. We did have iPads ordered for our younger kids, which those came in. Still waiting for some Chromebooks, but I think we could make it through if we absolutely had to. Um, but again, I'd, it's not so much about, it's about getting access to our kids and where they live. And like talking to Illuminate the company, they can get some of them down the county roads that are on the opposite side of the railroad tracks. But even, even if they take it out there to people's houses, it's over an hour from the main connectivity. And you know that, that's expensive in funding that the company won't take it to their house and parents and stuff won't pay. And we really can't pay those kind of fees to get it to a house either. So that's kind of what we're dealing with and our focus. Um, you know, I want a couple things we did do last spring too, once we kind of got everything under control, we did open up our computer labs and had kids scheduled to come in. And then we worked with our local library and they just like enhanced their 
<laughs> internet to get reach outside because it was closed. And so our kids could go park late hours or whatever outside the library to do some work that they wanted to do. One, it kind of got them out of the house and some free time away from everything, but they could then work in front of the library. So we were grateful for that community support. So that is our story. Well, thank you, Christy. And um, it's nice to know about the railroad crossing. As you know, the CBO works closely with um, all of our ISPs in the state. And so we'll be chatting with Luminate about um, that uh, challenge. Um, Jovita, Lauren, and Christy, thank you so much for sharing your stories and walking us through the challenges you, you face. I hope at least you found community in this conversation because you you know, heard a lot of similarities and challenges. Thank you for bringing up the device um, supply chain issue, Christy. I really appreciate you know, hearing about that. I think it's a, it, we really need to turn things over though now. We've got you know, a few minutes left in the, in, the, in the session to be able to have folks ask questions. So you guys are the experts, you're on the ground. Let's open it up to questions. Megan, do we have questions in the chat? Um, yeah, so there's a question from Brian McWilliams. Do you wanna unmute yourself and, and talk about, there we go. Sure, uh, let me Thank hop. You. Place a little bit quieter. Uh, um, so uh, I am in unincorporated Adams County um, uh, in, in an area that is surrounded by the city of Thornton. Um, my house is about 500 feet from a quote unquote standard neighborhood, and we're less than three miles from. Uh, new neighborhoods that are being installed with fiber to the home. Uh, unfortunately, our neighborhood, being that it's 30 to 40 years old, is only serviced by an out-of-date, unmaintained CenturyLink DSL network. Speeds available are definitely not broadband, uh, that we are only able to get between 3 and 10 megabytes uh, a second. Uh, in the neighborhood, there's 46 students and four teachers who cannot participate in the current learning model. Um, when things hit, Adams 12 no, never really reached out to any of this, any of us to work on it. On finally contacting them individually, I did get a hotspot, but that is only capable of six megs down, two up with when that hotspot is inside my home. Uh, it's exactly what Jovita mentioned uh, with, with uh, that, that hotspot limited bandwidth. Um, that's actually less than my DSL. Uh, when I did get to speak with the director at Adams 12 once about this, uh, he was the one who got me the hotspot, but uh, he never has contacted me again, uh, you know, for some of the long-term things that he had talked about. Um, we're, we're relatively well off uh, from a, an income standpoint. We would be more than happy and able to pay you know, standard residential customer charges for broadband, but um, you, you know, the, the $185,000 that CenturyLink offered to install uh, fiber to my home is, is a little bit harder pill to swallow. Given that we're not a city, we're not a county, we're not a special district, we're not a school district, how can we even get in touch with someone to get infrastructure upgraded or installed new? No one ever seems to return my phone messages. Um, can my nonprofit HOA do anything? Thing? Can I form a co-op? Are there models? Are there contacts? Uh, any ideas on, on how my, my, my daughter, who's in preschool now, will not be left behind uh, over her next 12 years of, 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 of learning? And thank you for any ideas. Um, I will take a shot at that one, uh, Brian. I think that's a, a question that's that's the bigger issue of of connectivity across the state. Um, you know that community, whether they're students in it or folks that are trying to participate in telemedicine, they're both all feeling the same uh, bandwidth constraints. And uh, there are federal funding programs that are out there to support uh, connectivity for areas that do not have sufficient bandwidth. And I would be happy to talk to you offline about those programs. Um, this program today, um, our webinar today is really focused on um, the programs that can help 
those students in that community uh, get connected from, um, from programs that are available to the school districts. So that's not to say that these programs couldn't assist your community. They could if there were providers willing to connect to your homes in, that, uh, in your HOA and provide um, better bandwidth for, um, to enable e-learning. So, but I think your question is much broader and it's very much what are, we, what are we doing in this state about broadband connectivity in those areas that are unserved um, or do not have capacity sufficient for synchronous um, e-learning and telemedicine or remote work even, right? So um, I will reach out to you, Brian, if you'll put your uh, information in the chat and you and I can follow up on this after, after the call, after the webinar. Okay. Thank you. Excellent. Um, Megan, other questions for our panelists? Uh, I have a question. Uh, it kind of stems from, from Brian's question. Um, you all talked about a lot of different uh, groups of students and different needs. And I think Brian kind of brought up a, a group that um, none of you specifically mentioned. So, my question is how how are you um, managing and handling the various different needs? I know there's um, mobile populations, there's at risk populations, um, there's the folks like Brian who who could pay for service if it were available. Um, so if anyone has thoughts on on how you've dealt with that or any anecdotes. I, this is Lauren. I'd be happy to, to start it off. Um, for sure, I think there, everyone has different, like a, different populations have different needs for sure. And I think that's something that was a, a learning for us through this um, because usually our point of view is helping those who are, um, you know, our free and reduced lunch population, our second language learners. But I think as it's been highlighted a couple of times is for sure, even those who do have home internet access when they have you know, two or more adults working in the home as well as they have their children trying to access, like that creates its own issues for sure. Um, and so I think we by no means have it all figured out, but one um, one solution for the one um, group of, of kids that are more mobile or harder to reach is we really leverage our community organizations. So knowing many times they know their kids best. And so working through our federal programs office to reach those students as well as um, ensuring that like Denver Kids and other organizations have the best information to provide to students. Um, and then I think on the flip side for those who may have means but just there's issues that exist um, in those cases is trying to connect them directly with the providers to access those resources. But I, I think we um, definitely you know, know that there are better solutions and are continuing to work to reach all of our families, regardless of what their situation may be. Great, thank you. Uh, Jovita or Christy, have any thoughts? Sure, I, I, can, um, I can add to that a little bit. You know, we, we've worked really hard to support families, all families. My role at Sanchez is specifically to help support our families and create equity um, as much as I can for our students. Um, we have a full uh, family support team and we work with every family where they are. We meet them where they are and we help them um, get connected and get access to their education. And I know that the district has a really strong um, service desk number as well, supporting families. And I believe we, we support all families regardless of what their, their means are and what they, um, what they need. We, we just want to make sure that we're supporting students thriving in school during this time. And so it, it, it all comes down to just being willing to, to support all families as best we can and being able to um, handle each case individually if we have to, if they have a need that we haven't seen before. 
This is Christy. The only thing I'll add to that, it, that is a tough situation. We actually have a subdivision in Hayden that's the same way that was built, then the went bankrupt. And so then they pulled all resources out of it. So it's been kind of a contentious thing. So that's why we did open the school and worked with the library to have that. It doesn't provide, you know, long terms, um, sustainable in the home, but at least we could provide something for the students because that's, you know, I don't know how to fix that. That is a really good question of private neighborhoods and some different things. So, but like everybody else, we try and work with them and do what we can. Mm -hmm. um, since no one else is piping in with questions, I'll just keep going with mine. <laughs> but feel free to unmute yourselves if you have questions. Um, so my next question is regarding cost. Um, I know Lauren, you mentioned the the cost of hot spots and the ongoing um, cost that you guys are that you have for connectivity. Uh, Christy, you mentioned that um, you were able to pay for you know some connectivity without any issues. Um, I'm wondering, is is the funding from uh, the stimulus? funds and when that runs out will you be facing um, issues with paying for those those services or is this something that that your school district has thought about in the general funding and can continue that when the stimulus funding goes away I can answer that from our perspective. So yes, we have used stimulus funding to pay for what we've used so far, um, which sustainability, no, it will run out as we know when our deadline to spend it. However, we have a very strong philanthropist group in Steamboat that does all of Route County. Um, it's the Craig Sheckman Family Foundation and their whole focus is on students that are at risk needing support and it can be, in any way and we can use funds for that. And they're very generous and very giving. And they've reached out to us like every probably six weeks right now. Okay, what do you need? Where can we help? And they've just been wonderful. So we're right now relying on them. We do have to come up with a long-term solution because as we've all said, this isn't gonna go away anytime soon. And reality is we have, I think 20, almost 30 kids that are online with us that chose to, that we're doing through CDLS and a couple of different other partners. But we also lost 18 kids to homeschooling. And when we lose 18 kids to homeschooling, that's a huge revenue loss for us. Yes, it's averaged out over five years, but it's gonna be a chunk of money over $200,000, which our budget is way different than the other two school district <laughs> budgets. Um, yeah. Our average, we get about 10,000 a kid, but you know, it's about a little over $5 million. So that's a chunk of change to us and a couple teachers. So, you know, we have to find something that's sustainable over time. Yeah, I, I will add um, similar from Denver's perspective is yes, yeah, certainly leveraging CARES funding um, stimulus funding for this emergency situation and now looking to more sustainable solutions similarly um, partnering with philanthropic organizations to sponsor kids and really trying to leverage um, you know any creative um, means um, to, to patch things together we we do in Denver have um, this was actually pre-pandemic but very much where we want to go as a district um, we have a ballot um, measure for one-to-one -one. so building that out further to our middle and high school students and so we're really excited about that because it very much mirrors where we want to go instructionally um, as a district um, but knowing that you know we're, we're hoping that that will pass and that will carry us um, through with that um, but I think very much so yeah looking to different ways to support this so it's sustainable we're not you know living year to year um, knowing the technology needs to be much more thought out than that so well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time. We've got about five minutes left in the hour. And I, I think it's always important when we have one of these sessions to allow the, the speakers, the, the experts, um, to provide closing remarks. So what do you all think is the most important lesson that other districts can learn from your experience? Um, what would you like to share? What would you like to leave um, our audience with today? 
And I'm going to, I'm going to pick on you, Jovita. I'm going to start you in order. So Jovita, if you could kick us off. Um, you know, I, I think we learn so much about no matter how much we plan that, you know, when, in, in a case like this, um, you have to be ready and willing to, to respond to, to new things that arise. And I also learned that partnerships are really important. Um, you know, when I think about Livewire and how they, we have been partnering with them for a long time and our CIO, Andrew Moore has worked so hard to develop that partnership and, and it, it paid off um, when we needed their help. They were willing to come, come in and, and support our students better. And so I think that it, um, it's partnerships, building relationships and, and being willing to kind of roll with the punches, as they say. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's what Perfect. I would say. Yeah, partnerships, reaching out, building that community support in the, in, so when a crisis occurs, you can turn to them. Lauren, how about you? What are your yeah, thoughts? very much in agreement. I, I think the two things I would add is um, one, the ability to flex or to be, um, you know, to pivot. So I think we very much were in reaction mode in the spring. And so as, you know, we moved through the spring, I think we were able to incorporate lessons learned and change what we were doing as we were doing it. Um, but then having time to reflect and think what is a more sustainable solution for the fall. And so um, I think just that ability to question what we're doing along the way was really helpful and know that, you know, the solution we start out with may not be what we continue to, to offer our students. Um, and I think second is understanding the perspective or getting more kind of on the ground feedback from families and what's working and what's not. So I think, you know, we have a large district, so our central office does our best, but I think we learn a lot very much so from our schools and from, you know, getting those personal stories through our help desk and others and, and figuring out, um, you know, how to troubleshoot from there. Agreed. Education is very personal. It's coming yeah. up with those customized solutions really works. So Christy, um, you're gonna have a back clean up here. <laughs> I agree with what they said. It's about being flexible and changing. And I guess the bottom line is there isn't a right way to do it. Every district is different, even within your own district. There's differences that you have to meet and you have to be able to be flexible and to meet those changes. Relationships are huge, not only with your community and your partnerships, but with your students as well to have them engaged. And, you know, don't be afraid to make mistakes. We all made plenty of mistakes transitioning into online learning and we've adjusted from them and it's like, okay, we won't do that again. And just being able to move forward. And that's been a challenge because it's an unknown. There's no precedence that's been set with what, where we're at and what we're dealing with. And I think we've all learned a lot from it. So. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Allie, uh, Delilah, Jovita, Lauren, and Christy. Uh, we couldn't have done this without you. Thank you for sharing your stories and lifting up your communities for the rest of us to learn from. Um, please join us next week on October 21st at 10 a.m. for the second webinar in the CBO uh, Student Connectivity Webinar Series. It is entitled, What is the Future of E-Rate? This webinar will feature introductory remarks and Q&A with Colorado Attorney General Phil Weiser and followed by a panel of experts. Please register at broadband.co.gov and join us next week for what I'm sure will be a provocative conversation about the need to modernize the E-rate program. I can't thank you all enough for joining us today. We appreciate uh, having you with us. Uh, stay safe and be well.